collaboration with the culture, tourism and antiquities department, government of Sin with an emphasis on the development of the Indus civilization in southern Sin. With this introduction, I would now request Dr. Didier to come on the stage and proceed the lecture. Good afternoon. Um, first, I would like to thank Professor Iqbal Choudhury for inviting me to give this conference on the Indus civilization and the archaeological research carried out by the French archaeological mission in Pakistan. This field work funded by the French Ministry of Foreign Affairs was a cooperation between the Department of Archaeology and Museums of Pakistan and the French National Center for Scientific Research. A new field program focused on South South Sindh was launched in 2015 with the Culture, Tourism and Antiquities Department, Government of Sindh. Since it is its discoveries in the beginning of the 20s, the Indus civilization has been the subject of the extensive archaeological research in Pakistan and in India. This brilliant civilization, which is dated to the second half of the third millennium BC, indeed forms the first urban phenomenon in South Asia. It was extended, as you can see here on the screen, on a vast uh, geographical area, including the major part of Pakistan, Northwest India, and here, Northeastern Afghanistan. The Indus civilization is mainly known through its well-planned cities such as Mohenjo-daro in Sindh and Harappa in Punjab, which are certainly the most classic and famous examples of this civilization. Their superficies were estimated to be between 150 and 250 hectares. More recently, an archaeological team from the Shah Abdul Universities of Sokol has discovered and excavated, which is maybe the second largest in the city in Pakistan. The Indus civilization uh, also included some uh, hundreds and hundreds of smaller settlements. Here you have just, um, just a few settlements represented here on the map, but these settlements were uh, involved in a dynamic interregional interaction systems with the major cities. Whatever the size, all the Indus settlements which were excavated evidenced innovative aspects of the Indus people, particularly in the public infrastructures and, of course, in the water engineering systems. You have you have here some examples of uh, these public uh, infrastructures, including vertical shaft wells, uh, basin platforms, sewage drains, or, as you can see here, some toilets which were constructed more than 2,000 years before the Romans. By contrast, no monumental buildings such as temples or palaces like in Mesopotamia or in Egypt in the same period were built in the Indus civilization. Similarly, the material culture of this complex society is not um, marked by uh, major court art, but by sophisticated craft productions that sometimes witnessed a very high level of skill, particularly to transform some raw materials by heat or chemical processes into highly elaborate products. The Indus people also produced a mysterious script, uh, which was mainly found on this uh, kind of seals in steatite, and this script has not been yet uh, deciphered. Excavations also show the complexity of the agropastoral economy of the Indus civilization, an economy which was based on an unprecedented uh, management of the natural landscape and, of course, on a dynamic network 
uh, between the production sites and the distribution sites in the, uh, the in this territory. For the first half of the 20th century, most of the Indus scholar stressed the sudden emergence of the Indus civilization. Although Chalcolithic settlements that predate the Indus uh, civilization were uncovered uh, in Pakistan, the origins of this fully developed civilization was attributed to a stimulus diffusion coming from Iran, from Mesopotamia, or from uh, Central Asia. But these scholars couldn't know at this period that many discoveries uh, made the last uh, 50 years uh, in Sindh, in Punjab, in KPK, or in other areas, of course, in Baluchistan, I will show this uh, later. Uh, these uh, discoveries would document a very long sequence of occupation preceding the appearance of the Indus civilization. Archaeologists also documented the periods um, which followed the Indus civilization in all that region, not only in Pakistan, but also in uh, India. These discoveries also allowed us to uh, subdivide the chronological sequence of the Indus civilization, which was considered before as a single period or as a monolithic entity, into three distinct periods. And this uh, subdivision was uh, mainly based on stratigraphical data, but also on uh, the study of developments and changes in architecture, in pottery, and artifacts. Understanding how the Indus civilization emerged and its social cultural developments uh, during uh, the fourth and third millennium BC was at the heart of the program that was created in 1958, this Pakistani-French collaboration I will present you now. This fieldwork, which started first in Sindh, was the beginning of a fruitful collaboration with the Department of Archaeology and Museums of Pakistan, a collaboration that lasts since more than 60 years. From uh, 59 to 62, uh, the founder of the Pakistani-French mission, Jean-Marie Cazal, excavated the site of Amri, which is located uh, in Sindh. This site, which is a mound of about uh, eight hectares, provided the remains of a settlement dated between the middle of the uh, fourth millennium BC until uh, the 19th century uh, BC. Today, uh, the chronological sequence defined at the site of Amri remains a uh, resource uh, defined at another site, um, the site of Kodiji, excavated by a Pakistani archaeologist named uh, Khan. And um, this site um, uh, since forms like a reference site for all the periodization of the Indus Valley and also especially the periodization of Southern Sindh. In 62, Jean-Marie Cazal moved to Baluchistan and started to excavate the site of Nindowari, which is located in the last Bela district. The fieldwork he conducted there uh, provided the remains of the only large-scale uh, uh, site uh, dated to the Kuli culture. What is a Kuli culture? It's a culture only appeared in this part of Baluchistan and which was contemporary with the Indus civilization. We know from uh, our observ I mean Jean-Marie Cazal observation of the site that trade contacts were maintained with the Indus civilization at this period, and the Kuli culture also offered the remains of some monumental architecture and an original pottery uh, style that you have here uh, on the screen. And this pottery style is deeply rooted in the rich iconography, um, strongly symbolic, that developed uh, in Baluchistan during this period. From 62, the Pakistani French team uh, focuses its archaeological work in uh, the northeastern part of Baluchistan, especially in the region of the site of Mergar. The first uh, site which was excavated by uh, the mission in this area was the site of Pirak. The site of Pirak is very interesting because it provided uh, the remains of um, an original settlement with substantial architecture uh, that was dated um, to the period after the Indus civilization. And this is very important because it allowed us to fill a gap 
between the end of the Indian civilization and what it is called the Vedic times. The material assemblage collected uh, in uh, Pirak uh, included mainly handmade pottery, uh, well decorated, but also uh, the first uh, figurines of horse, camels, horse riders in all South Asia. But what is it, maybe the most interesting feature of the site of Pirak is that um, this site also evidenced the setting of a new rural economy that marked the beginning of the agricultural revolution in South Asia. Why? Because we found at Pirak uh, the oldest remains of the cultivation of rice in South Asia. In 1975, the Pakistani French mission under the leadership of Jean-François Jarige started to excavate the famous site of Mergar in the northwestern part of the Kachi Plain. The contribution of the site is crucial uh, because it allowed to date back the development of the first farming communities, not only in Pakistan but in all South Asia, from the beginning of the 8th millennium BC. This site was also very important because um, some links were established between the Chalcolithic cultures uh, excavated in Mergar and the Indus civilization, particularly in the very high level of skill observed in the pyrotechnological craft industries. At Mergar, the most extensive operations conducted by the Pakistani French team were carried out in the Neolithic part of the site. This Neolithic part was dated between the 8th and the 5th millennium BC. For period 1, um, archaeologists excavated uh, more than 75 buildings uh, built in mud bricks, and we show sometimes some remains of uh, wall paintings. You have an example, a drawing of one kind of this wall painting here. The archaeologists also uncovered 318 Neolithic graves which were associated with a very rich assemblage, including here a huge collection of jewelry made in seashell, but also of jewelry made in various stones. And some of these stones, this is very interesting because some of these stones were not, um, I mean, available in the natural environment of this population, like, for example, lapis lazuli or turquoise, and these stones are only available in Central Asia. So it means that during this period, uh, since the 8th millennium BC, there were some trade contacts between the people at Mergar and some other population in Central Asia. The only very interesting feature is that some of the jewelry, especially those uh, manufactured in steel tight, um, witnesses some substantial technical achievement um, and um, very high level of specialization, especially to transform this um, uh, miniature striated beads uh, which were manufactured in stereotype, you know that the uh, natural color of the stereotype is black, but they also transform uh, by uh, heat and chemical processes uh, this stereotype into white color. So it means that during this period they already had, uh, I mean, an important control of the chemical and physical processes. Excavations at Mergar, uh, Neolithic sites, also provided uh, the oldest evidence in South Asia of metal objects and cotton. It also, uh, the site provided uh, the oldest human figurine um, represented here in a sitting position uh, for all South Asia. Last but not least, the Neolithic site uh, provided also the earliest evidence of dentist surgery, not only in South Asia, but in the old world uh, archaeological data. These results were um, I mean, obtained by an Italian team working with the French team uh, from uh, the study of uh, monochromes. So this is very, very interesting. We also know from palynological, um, botanical, and zoological studies that an incipient farming economy based on the cultivation of barley and wheat was progressively settled on in Merga during this period. And uh, besides hunting activities, um, 
the earliest pastoralism, first limited to uh, goat, became increasingly dominating by um, the pastoralism of sheep, but also of uh, bovines, in which the, the, the species, the boss indico species, which is in fact the zebu, was the predominant form of these bovines. So again, this is the all earliest evidence in the all South Asia of this pastoralism of uh, the zebu. From about uh, 6,000, 6,500 BC, that marked the beginning of what we call the second Neolithic period in Merga. Um, this is an Italian important period because it's during this period that pottery uh, started to be manufactured on the site. Um, another interesting feature of this period is that um, uh, some new uh, large and compartimented buildings which were used as granaries were also built. The long-lasting following period three, Mergar, uh, which is dated from uh, the beginning of the fifth millennium to uh, the middle of the fourth millennium BC, marks what we call the beginning of the Chalcolithic period in Pakistan. The architectural remains that spread over a now large area of about 100 hectares in Mergar mainly included the same kind of compartmented buildings that I show uh, before. Um, and the team also excavated for this period more than uh, 100 graves. This period three is mainly characterized by the development of various specialized craft techniques, particularly in the pottery, which we can very finely manufactured and uh, decorated with a great variety of geometric and also naturalistic motifs. But during this period, um, New uh, technological, technological uh, achievements were also evident, like <coughs> the production, for example, of uh, the first copper ornament in South Asia, including um, the manufacturing uh, technique, which is called the lost wax casting technique. And also, it's during this period that um, very elaborated products, like uh, glazed stereotype beads or faience, become to be produced in the region. The following periods, four to seven at Mergar, which are dated to the second half of the fourth millennium and very beginning of the third millennium uh, BC, uh, show the development of a new architectural complex uh, at the site of Mergar with uh, some many monumental constructions like these pilastered walls. This period are, uh, is also distinguished by the production of very fine and elaborate terracotta figurines especially uh, human figurines here, and a very sophisticated uh, glyptic. Uh, during this period, uh, the pottery was more and more finely elaborated, involving some uh, very complex techniques of manufacturing, especially for these um, uh, fine gray painted vessels, which involve uh, such techniques as, for example, the firing in a reducing atmosphere, a reducing atmosphere which was, which was obtained by peeling the vessels in a sealed jar, you know, to, to, to allow not the oxygen to, to enter during the firing. After, after this period, I mean, after, um, sorry, um, to uh, the 26th century BC, Naga was abandoned uh, before the emergence of the Indus civilization, but the site was reoccupied at the end of the third millennium BC, which corresponds to the third Indus civilization period, in a form of, of a large cemeteries um, with simple graves, but also with uh, cenotaphs. And what it is very interesting is that in the material uh, which was recovered uh, in these graves, some materials um, obviously come from Central Asia. This pottery, for example, or here this, um, this setter, comes from uh, Central Asian cultures. At the end of Nergal excavations, the main question for the Pakistani French team was to better document and understand the links between the long sequence here defined at Mergar and the beginning of the Indus civilization. And to um, further document uh, this uh, issue, 
uh, the team started to excavate uh, a new site uh, located near the site of Mergar, which is a site of Nocheru, six kilometers from Mergar. This site is very interesting. It was, it was occupied uh, between um, the 31st uh, century BC until the, the 19th uh, 100th century, sorry. Uh, it means covering all the Indus civilization period, but also the pre-Indus period. For period one, which corresponds to the pre-Indus period at Nocero, the team um, excavated some architectural remains in red brick and also a very rich material assemblage which was similar to source discovered at Merga for the same period. But one of the main contributions of this uh, pre-Indus site came from what we call the period 1D levels here. And this period 1D is very interesting because we found there some ceramic vessels and also some figurine uh, which um, helped us to better understand both the setting of the Kuli culture and the Indus civilization. In the following periods 2 to 4, um, Nocero became um, a true Indus civilization settlement. I mean, the architecture and the, um, the planification of the urbanism of, of the city is quite the same as Mohenjo Daro. I mean, the site is smaller, of course, the site is only uh, six, six hectares, but I mean, the urbanism is the same as Mohenjo Daro with some uh, streets, with some uh, sewage drains, some water engineering uh, structures. So, this is very interesting. Here is uh, the material culture uh, discovered in the Indus civilization levels uh, at Nocero, which included uh, typical Indus civilization pottery, but also a good collection of figurines of uh, these uh, stereotype seals uh, with the Indus scripting. At the time of Nocero excavations and referring to these very interesting results obtained in the Kachibolan area, another team of uh, French archaeologists, in fact this is the same mission, but another group of archaeologists started um, to do some work in the Kachmakran region, also in collaboration with the Department of Archaeology and Museums of Pakistan. Why this excavation, these explorations were conducted? It's because um, we had nothing, no data on this region before. Some very uh, few surveys were conducted in the beginning of the 30s, but at this time, you know, in the 30s, people were focused on the discovery of Mohenjo-Daro and Harappa in the Indus Valley. So they didn't give any importance to the charcoalistic cultures discovered in Makran. So the first uh, scientific program conducted here there were, uh, was carried out by uh, the Pakistani French team. And our objective for the first time was to establish the first chrono-cultural sequence in Makran. The first part of the program uh, conducted between 87 and uh, 90 was to carry out extensive archaeological surveys to inventory the archaeological sites of the region, to document their state of preservation, and to collect surface materials for dating, um, I mean, these ancient cultures uh, discovered in Makran. And this archaeological map was progressively completed until 2007, which was the last year that our team worked in Makran. And uh, currently, our archaeological map, there is just a small uh, part of this complete map, but our um, current map includes more than 230 sites um, which we discovered. The chronological sequence in Macron was mainly established from the results of the excavations carried out at the site of Mirikalat. The site of Mirikalat is located here um, in the Cage Valley, just a few kilometers from uh, <coughs> the, um, the town of Turbat. Mirikalat um, was selected for excavations because of its long sequence of occupation defined by some surveys uh, conducted before to explore the sites. And um, so we defined that the site was 
occupied from the beginning of the 5th millennium BC until um, the, um, the beginning of the 2nd millennium BC. After a gap during the 2nd millennium BC, the site was continuously reoccupied uh, from uh, the 1st millennium BC until uh, the last centuries. The site of Mirikalat is here covered with a um, fortress that dated to uh, the 18th century, Islamic fortress. The main contribution of um, these excavations um, uh, is also that, um, sorry, um, it was the first time that we had the opportunity to document these uh, Chalcolithic cultures. And the third phase of the program that started in uh, 97 until to, uh, 2007 was divided into two field operations. The first operation illustrated here was to document the uh, ancient fishermen settlements here on the Macran coast. It was done by our colleagues from uh, CNRS uh, who also conducted some ethnological observations, you know, to compare the fish remains found in these oldest settlements and also the techniques, the fishery techniques um, carried out in uh, Macran today. And uh, um, along with these ethnographic studies, we also proceeded to a paleogeographical reconstruction of the ancient coastline dated to the 3rd millennium BC. So this is the coastline of Macran, um, and this coastline was totally different uh, than um, the one today. The second operation uh, started in 97 was uh, the excavation of the site of Shaitum. The site of Shaitum is uh, located here, um, uh, still, um, I mean, um, again in the in the Kej um, Valley, a few kilometers from uh, Turbat and Mirikalat. It is it is very interesting to note that um, the oldest settlements we discovered at Shaitum, uh, which is dated to the second half of the fifth millennium BC, provided this kind of circular hut basement which was um, associated with a very little lithic industry and also with bone tools. Later, after this husbandment, uh, the people started to build this kind of big quadrangular constructions in stones. And these constructions um, provided a good collection of uh, botanical material. Significant changes occurred during the period two defined at Chaitum. This period is dated to the first half of the third millennium BC, and this period provided evidences of quadrangular construction built with stone foundations and mud brick walls. Here is a building collapsed and burned, which was excavated by our mission in 2004, and it is very interesting because because this building was collapsed, we were able to find inside some remains of perishable materials which, were, uh, which are used to, to be difficult to find, actually. I mean, and in particular, we uh, found some remains of burned fish nets. That is very interesting. And also good collections of um, uh, seeds were collected there. During this period, too, in Macran, pottery uh, started to be manufactured, and this pottery was only attested in domestic contexts. It included basketware, um, courseware, and also a fine, very fine elaborated pottery with this kind of decorations. And um, this pottery, uh, in um, its painting style, was very influenced by communities um, coming from southeastern Iran because this pottery style is very close from the pottery style found uh, for the same period to uh, southeastern Iran. So that's very interesting. I mean, some regional interactions, strong regional interactions were evidenced between communities uh, of Iran and Makran during this period. About a hundred of burials, uh, which form what we call the oldest graveyard at Chaitum, were also excavated. Uh, in these graves, people were uh, buried in a flexed position, as you can see here, uh, like in Merga, 
but these people were covered systematically with red ochre. Sometimes these people were also, this, their bodies covered in matte coffin, covered with red ochre. And uh, the funerary deposits included, like in Mergar, um, some jewelry made in seashell, but also this uh, kind of necklaces made in steel tights. We also found, uh, for example, this kind of uh, stone mace head or a vessel in alabaster. These graves also evidenced the earliest use of copper metallurgy in Makran, which is illustrated here by the discovery of uh, this compartmented uh, seal in copper of this uh, axe, copper axe, which was um, wrapped in a linen textile. This object was analyzed in the French laboratory of the Louvre Museum. During this period, the subsistence pattern uh, was based, like in Mergar, on the cultivations of cereals, barley, wheat, um, and the prevailing domestication of goats. But what is interesting, too, in Macran is that hundreds and hundreds of fish bones were recovered into the excavations, and their presence in these domestic levels, uh, along with their, the presence of, uh, I mean, uh, seashells in the graves, uh, means that um, the sea and its marine resources played both a symbolic and nutritive role uh, into uh, the Macran population during this period. For the following period 3A, which is only represented not by uh, architecture but only by uh, excavations of graves, um, I mean, there was not a lot of changes during this period, especially in uh, the funerary practices. But what is it uh, new in Macran during this period is that the people were buried with dozens and dozens of ceramic vessels for only one grave. For example, this is the ceramic assemblage which was found in one single grave in Macran. And all the graves we excavated, we excavated more than 120 graves. All of them included such dozens of vessels like this, so it was fantastic for us to excavate this material. Another distinctive feature uh, which was, um, I mean, evidenced in this, um, in this uh, burials uh, from uh, this uh, period 3A, dated between uh, 3500 3500 BC and the beginning of the sub-millennium is also uh, the highest uh, use of uh, copper metallurgy. For example, almost each grave uh, found in Macran uh, contained one or two metal objects. And this is interesting because this compartment uh, copper seal, which were found only in Macran in all Pakistan but also in all South Asia, were found only in female graves. In the other side, we found this uh, fantastic object in uh, 98, which is a weight, a weight which was analyzed uh, in the laboratory of the Louvre Museum in France. And this analyze showed that this whale was manufactured with a jacket copper. The jacket copper is represented here in uh, red or orange. And it was filled with pure lead. And here, the decoration of this um, weight was um, done with um, fragments, uh, mosaic of uh, shell inlays. So that's very interesting. The iconography is typical from southeastern Iran, but this is the only place in all Middle Asia where this kind of artifact was found. And it was found in one of the, um, or one of the only male grave uh, excavated in the site. For the following periods, which are dated to the first um, half of the third millennium, which correspond to period 3b in Macron chronology, this period is unfortunately not documented by excavations, but only by explorations. And particularly here in the Dash Plain, which is located in um, western Ketch Macron, we found dozens and dozens of settlements of, um, of graveyards but also of a uh, pottery manufacturing area uh, covered with uh, thousands of uh, ceramic vessels. But unfortunately, most of these graveyards 
like this one uh, were looted between 2004 and 2005. We tried to conduct some rescue operations there to collect all the ceramics which were not uh, collected by the looters. So these um, rescue operations helped us to restore and study um, thousands of ceramic vessels, very interesting because with a diversity of painted decorations, including uh, geometry, but also naturalistic motifs, um, zoomorphological motifs, and this poetry uh, that I published in the book in 2013 is also interested because it was manufactured for sure in Ketchmakran, and it was, um, I mean, um, exported in very uh, far region, like for example in Oman or in Afghanistan at this period. So, I mean, at this period, people from, from Afghanistan, from the Oman Peninsula or elsewhere, had trade contact with Makran. Why? Because Makran was able to produce uh, pottery in such quality that all the people in these different areas wanted to have some. So that's very interesting. Another interesting feature, um, I mean, evidence in Mirikalat is the discovery of an Indus civilization settlement there, an Indus civilization occupation, which, is, which was located in this part here of the site. It was not excavated in a huge area, but the architect architectural features also are comparable to source of other Indus civilization settlements with some, uh, for example, uh, semi-buried jars for the storage or uh, granaries, the discoveries of bathroom or sewage drain, um, comparable to source from Mohenjo-Daro. The material culture uh, found in this uh, Indus level is also typically uh, Indus, with, for example, this kind of ivory comb, seals, uh, bangles in shell, here this uh, what we call etched cornoline beads, and for sure pottery. And this pottery uh, was compared to the Indus civilization pottery found in Noshero by our missions, and um, it helped us to date the Indus civilization occupation at Mirikalat from the first period of the Indus civilization. Another interesting feature in uh, the material assemblage of these Indus levels at Mirikalat is also the discovery among the Indus material of a proportion of non-Indus ceramic vessels. Most of the time, um, in all the Indus civilization sites in Pakistan, most of the times the Indus civilization replaced the, the previous Chalcolithic cultures. But this is not the case in Makran. In Makran, this um, Indus civilization coexisted with the local cultures. So that's ver a very interesting uh, thing. Despite its very limited size, size because Merikalat is a very small site compared to uh, Mohenjo-Daro or Harappa, its location here in the middle of the Cage Valley was certainly strategic for the exchange network between the mountainous region of Baluchistan that I am not uh, represented here, and um, for trade with um, the Indus Valley. These trade activities were made possible, of course, by land by, by road, but also by coastal shipping, which is well attested in Makran. Why? Because two other Indus civilization settlements were also found on the Makran coast, here the site of Sutkagandor Sutka and the site of Sutkaku, which are obviously ports, harbors of the Indus civilization. In the current state of knowledge, um, Sutka Gandor, Mirikalat, and Sotkako provided the archaeological remains um, of the westernmost occupation of the Indus civilization. And uh, when our uh, fieldwork stopped in Makran in 2007, we have focused uh, our studies on the material uh, coming from these three sites, and we are preparing now with my colleagues the final publication of this material. And uh, this work was made possible also with the support of the French Alliance, where we conducted our um, uh, material studies. And uh, we're expecting to, uh, to, uh, for the book to come out in 2017.
Between 2007 and 2014, when we stopped our field work in Macron, we also launched in France analytical programs, including geochemical and petrographic studies on, of samples of pottery and artifacts coming from various sites in Baluchistan and Sin, coming from Amri, Merga, Nochero, or from Macron. And these compositional studies um, were um, done to better characterize the craft developments and changes um, in, uh, I mean, in the craft productions of this region to, for example, to identify the raw materials used by the potters or to define what are the uh, regional variations in the manufacturing techniques between the different areas. And um, from this uh, analysis, we were able also to uh, reconstruct some uh, interregional and superregional exchange networks. That's, that's what I say uh, that uh, we have found some uh, Makrani vessels in Oman because it was established by this compositional analysis. In 2015, now, uh, the Pakistani French mission has launched, as I mentioned in the introduction of my presentation, a new field program in Sindh in cooperation with the Directorate of Archaeology, Culture, Tourism and Antiquities Department. Indeed, with its very rich cultural heritage, Sindh represents for Indian civilization studies one of the best field research, especially for working on the emergence of the Indian civilization but also uh, for working on the regional variations of settlement patterns in the Indus civilization. However, in this Sindh region, very few sites, very few sites dated uh, both to the pre-Indus and Indus civilization periods were excavated. And um, also the chronological uh, sequence of Sindh, this proto-history chronological sequence, need some um, achievements. Through uh, new explorations, uh, excavations, and environmental studies, um, along with the sim systematic comparison of the data with those collected in Baluchistan, our program is to re-examine this chronological sequence of sources of things to better characterize the transition between the pre-Indus and Indus civilization periods, so it means to work on the beginnings of the Indus civilization, but also our program is to bring further data on craft specialization, stylistical and technological achievements and changes in Sindh. Our uh, current program uh, that I developed in collaboration with my colleague uh, Chakir Ali from the Exploration and Excavation Branch here in Karachi includes three field operations. The first field operation is to complete the archaeological map of the region of Sindh Kohistan and to carry out test findings on sites we show from the material, uh, from the uh, surface materials transition between the pre-Indus and Indus civilization periods. And our current work is focused here on the region uh, of the, in the Kirta area, of the region of the northwest Baran and Suk rivers near the ca villages of Karchat and Tong. Why? Because uh, some previous explorations uh, conducted by our Pakistani colleagues from the local department here evidenced some Chalcolithic and in the site in this region. But the published data are very fragmentary and they need a detailed study. It is also this region a strategic location to work on regional interactions between here, southeastern Baluchistan, and the Indus Valley. Last, um, this region um, is also strategic because it helps us to develop a geo-archaeological work. I mean, because with the, in the Indus Valley itself, I mean, most of the Indus sites are covered with meters and meters of sediments coming from the alluvial plain, and it's very difficult to excavate. In this area, we have not these environmental constraints, so we can be able to, to do some uh, test soundings very quickly. Uh, this is, for example, just a quick uh, overview of um, the very short survey we conducted in March uh, 2015. Very short because um, uh, we had some logistics uh, constraints, especially to find some accommodation in this very isolated area. But during this short um, two-day surveys, we discovered uh, 11 archaeological sites. 
and their sites were dated uh, from uh, the beginning of the third millennium BC uh, to the last um, centuries AD. Um, among these 11 sites, I mean, um, half of them were already um, previously discovered by our Pakistani colleagues, but some of these sites are new. And this is, for example, the survey itinerary we conducted uh, this year in this uh, area. Among these sites, a specific attention in our program was paid to the site of Tongbuti. Tongbuti is a very small town, I mean Tong, the village of Tong, the modern village of Tong, is a very uh, small village located here um, at the border of uh, the Baluchistan uh, part of the Kirtar range. And this site, Tongbuti, is very interesting because it evidenced some very well preserved in surface uh, um, architectural structures in stones. And another interesting feature of the site is this Indus civilization settlement. It's an Indus civilization settlement. It was evidenced by the material found on the surface. Uh, is a fortified site. I mean, this site is not surrounded by a fortification built by Indus civilization people, but by the natural protective barrier here that surrounded the site. And obviously, this natural barrier was used as a fortification. So, and um, we can uh, easily assume that uh, this site maybe played a key role in the interactions between the, uh, I mean, um, the, the Kirtan regions, I mean, the Baluchistan part of the Kirtan region and the Sindh part. Uh, during the times of the Indus civilization. So we have planned to conduct uh, this year in January or February some test soundings in that site. And um, the archaeological mapping of the region is completed by an environmental approach for be a better understanding how the fluvial system and its sedimentation um, have affected the spatial organization of the Indus uh, civilization settlements. And this is, for example, some environmental geomorphological study we have carried out uh, in March 2015. And these are only working maps. This is not maps for publication. But we pointed on that map, you know, the area we have to, uh, to study again in uh, 2016. Our team also launched uh, in last March um, new excavations at the site in the civilization site of Chanudaru in the district of Nawabsha. The site um, of Chanudaru was previously studied uh, by um, archaeologists in the 1930s. Some excavations were conducted in 1931 and 1936. And this site is very important because it has often been described in the archaeological literature as one of the most important excavated in the sites in Sin, but also in all the Indian civilization. And um, this is a very small site of six hectares, nothing comparable to Mohenjo-Daro, but this site has produced amazing uh, craft productions. And people think that this site uh, played, uh, was like a craft production center for the Indus civilization, for all the Sin area. And um, the chronological frame of the Indus period at Nosheru uh, was reviewed by uh, my colleagues by comparative studies with the site of Chanudaru. And um, these discoveries um, showed that um, a settlement dating to the first period of the Indus civilization is obviously present, um, I mean, at Chanudaro, but it has never been excavated by um, the archaeologists in the 30s. So this is very interesting for us if we can, I mean, collect more data of the first period of the Indus civilization at this site. Also, there are uh, other architectural issues that um, we have to, to raise because in the 30s, as you can imagine, the excavation uh, techniques were not the same, and usually people were used to excavate very quickly the sites with a lot of workers and not to conduct some detailed stratigraphy or architectural data, um, work. So um, 
In last March, our uh, Pakistani French mission opened a very small sounding in one week. We had no time um, to, to do more because uh, it was in March, and March is quite very hot in this uh, area. And we opened these trenches only to know if we could recover levels dated to the first period of the Indus civilization. We carried out these small soundings with the help of the local workers, and um, we recovered here in this small sounding of three by two meters four different architectural phases uh, which were obviously dated from the material studies to the first period of the Indus civilization. So that is, is very interesting for us. And the other important feature is that the previous excavations at Shanudaro evidenced only architecture in Beckett bricks, like in uh, Mohenjo Daro, for example. But for this old period, we found architecture in mud brick. So this is very important to explain the emergence of the Indus civilization. Another important result from this very brief uh, test sounding is also the discovery in this small part of the sites of hundreds and hundreds of fragments of terracotta bangles, terracotta bowls, and pottery, um, which um, mainly evidence the presence of a craft uh, manufacturing area, especially in this uh, location of the site. So this is very interesting to, to study um, uh, more this um, part in the future. And so um, our team will uh, resume excavations our second uh, field season in uh, January 2016, and we will open here a large excavation at the location of Mont 2 to better uh, document this architecture and material culture of the first period of the Indus civilization. Um, so to conclude, I would like to thank all the institutions and people that made this work in Balochistan and seen possible and successful, especially uh, the Department of Archaeology and Museums of Pakistan, and um, recently the Sin Culture, Tourism and Antiquities Department, which is our partner for the new program. And also, uh, I would like to thank the support of the Embassy of Pakistan in France, and for sure, um, the Embassy of um, France in Pakistan, the French General Consulate, the French Ministry of Foreign Affairs, which founded our program, and the uh, French Cultural Center, the, the, the Alliance Française in Karachi, for its logistic support. Um, last, um, our field work, um, as you can imagine, would have never been possible without the support, advices, and hospitality of our local friends um, in Mergar, in Makran, and um, in um, Sindh. And um, I am very grateful to these people because um, these people had an unfailing friendship and um, they were deeply committed in uh, the preservation and the highlighting of their cultural heritage. So I thank the, I'm very grateful to the local population for that. So thank you for your attention, and if you have questions, I will be pleased to answer. Thank you very much uh, for an amazing presentation of rich cultural heritage of this part of the world. Uh, he, uh, I traveled all along and I've seen lots of places and Greek, Roman uh, cultural sites and my impression was that, uh, you know, what you were presenting was more of uh, this region, uh, the civilization was mainly based on commoners, you know, common people, cities, uh, facilities and amenities available for common people because in contrast to that, when you see uh, in Greece, Mesopotamia, Asia Minor, or Egypt, you see these large amphitheaters and big palaces. Yeah. So what is your impression between the cross-cultural differences between the ancient civilization mm -hmm. at the same time? It is difficult to explain uh, these strong differences, for example, between uh, the Mesopotamian or Egyptian civilization at the same time and the Indus civilization. But for sure, um, I mean, the Indus civilization and the Chalcolithic cultures before uh, were um, complex societies, I mean, particularly in their uh, craft productions. But I don't know why um, 
I mean, they, they had not the same um, kind of life. I mean, for example, I was talking about uh, the absence of palaces, of temples, for example, in the, in the civilization. We don't know yet um, who, uh, what was the social uh, economical organization of this in this civilization we didn't we don't know yet who were the leader of this civilization if it was a pacific population if it was a population of um, i mean priests like the famous king priest of mohenjo daro um, but um i mean for sure there is i mean um endogenic development, I mean, a local development of all this civilization, which is not comparable to the one in Middle Asia. So it means that there were not two different worlds, because these worlds were in contact, but definitely there was two different, I mean, um, uh, development uh, of population of civilization in this part of the world. And it's very interesting to, to, to know this different, such a deep social differentiation uh, between all these civilizations. Uh, but this absolutely fascinating civilizations of commoners, we don't even know the language, so we were not really able to have decipher the language, which is one of the most Im important impediment in understanding of it. Any attempt towards that? Um, unfortunately, I mean, since the, the discovery of the Indus civilization, uh, many, many attempts uh, were uh, done to decipher the Indus script or to connect this uh, Indus script with some uh, languages spoken in uh, all Asia. I mean, people tried to connect uh, this um, Indus script with Indo-European languages, with uh, old languages in India, but in fact, after more than one um, century of research, we are not able now to, to have any, I mean, any clues to, to, to better understand who were this population, which language they spoken, and it's fascinating because, um, as I, as I showed in the, um, sorry, in the, um, in the map, the first map of my presentation, not working, sorry, just one minute. Yes. As I, sh as I showed in this presentation, the Indus civilization spread over um, a vast territory, a huge territory, which was more important geographically than Mesopotamia or Egyptian civilization in the same time. So how can we imagine that there was only um, one language spoken in all that um, vast uh, area? It's quite impossible. But we have to say that all the... I mean, all the seals because discovered on the, um, in, um, in all India and Pakistan, you know, all these seals had the same kind of a script. So it means that maybe there is not a s only one language, but maybe uh, there is different languages, but with one way of encoding uh, the language of one um, mean of... Um, of uh, um, exchange between these people, and it was for sure the, this kind of artifacts. So that's fascinating. And in the same time, um, you have seen that considering, I mean, we have no temples in the Indus civilization, no uh, major, uh, you know, palaces like in Mesopotamia, but you have this kind of high level in public infrastructures. I mean, especially the water management system. It's totally incredible. Even in Mesopotamia, you have not this kind of uh, wells. I mean, these wells will be developed as this uh, bathing system toilets only during the antiquity in this part of the world. So how is it possible to have this kind of civilization without um, monumental constructions, but associated with this kind of uh, such elaborated uh, system, so that's fascinating. And for sure, uh, this, all this um, field research needs more and more achievements to better understand why. Is there any relation between RM culture and Indus 
stimulation. Connection between Indus and what? Arin. Oh, this is a very, very old uh, story. I mean, people tried to make some connections with the Indo Ar Aryan people and the Indus civilization for more than one century. And um, it was thought before that the end, end of the Indus civilization uh, was due to the invasions of Indo Aryan um, horsemen coming from uh, Central Asia. But now I would say that because of discoveries, for example, carried out in Pirak or in other uh, parts of Pakistan in um, the Harappa region or in northwestern India, we know that there is no evidences of, I mean, a foreign populations coming in this part of Asia at these times. I mean, for example, Pirak, the site of Pirak, I showed you um, in the beginning of the presentation. In Pirak, you have some new elements like the agricultural revolution with the cultivation of rice, but in the same time, in some part of the material culture, this is the continuity of the Indus civilization. So if there were another culture, for sure, they will have, um, I mean, replaced all these uh, cultural um, uh, things in uh, at Pirak. And this is not the case. And there were also some um, analysis conducted by many scholars, DNA analysis on bonds, but unfortunately there is very few graveyards of the Indus civilization excavated in both Pakistan and India. We don't know why, because maybe these cemeteries were not located in the site itself, but outside, and the only graves excavated were dated to the last period of the Indus civilization, and as I, for sure, uh, as I know, there is no, I mean, um, achievements in this research. Um, the only thing is that, uh, for sure, um, I mean, especially our um, Indian colleagues would like to connect, I mean, the Indus civilization with the Indo-Aryan, with the Hinduism and everything, but for sure there is no archaeological evidences at all of this kind of connections. So, unfortunately, no, uh, no uh, uh, new evidence for this. Thank you very much. And then, well, some questions arise in some, in some newspaper that maybe this Indus civilization was destroyed by nuclear power. Is there any evidence? What's, sorry. In this civilization, in this civilization was destroyed by nuclear power. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I had many times uh, this uh, very interesting hypothesis, but believe me, uh, there is nothing to, to, to say about it. Because uh, now we have more and more data. Uh, for sure, the, the end of the Indus civilization was um, very uh, intriguing for uh, many uh, decades, but now we have enough evidences which definitely uh, proves that, um, I mean, the end of the civ Indus civilization is due to um, the combination of several factors, environmental factors, because some paleontological studies conducted especially in Sindh or in northwestern India showed that the climate at this time, at the end of the civilization, uh, suddenly changed. The climate becomes, um, you know, so different that um, uh, there were a lot of floods and for sure all this Indus Valley uh, river system, which is a very um, dynamic river system, uh, maybe there was some economical problem due to these uh, environmental changes. So there is a combination of all these factors, and for sure uh, there is no evidences of any nuclear, uh, uh, I mean, uh, <laughs> it, it is quite funny. But you know why uh, this hypothesis uh, came, is that on this Indus civilization site, there was such a high level of pyrotechnological skill. I mean, you have a craft uh, manufacturing area everywhere covered with this um, waste of, um, I mean, uh, fired clay and everything, remains of um, burnt walls of ovens and everything, that this amazing burning area were interpreted as maybe area burned by alien people. I don't know, but it's, it's just um, stupid things, believe okay. me. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Maybe the last one. Dear Madam, thank you very much for your presentation because you have showed a very good cooperation between uh, our two countries, France and uh, Pakistan. Uh, you have used the one word many times during uh, your uh, presentation, 
to excavate. So I understand the meaning of this word, but I would like to know in your uh, meaning, uh, when you dig an excavation, is yeah. it for one meter deep, 10 meter deep? It depends. 100 meter deep. It, it depends on the site. You know, it depends on the morphology of the site for sure. Um, most of the archaeological sites um, show some mounds, you know, some mounds. Uh, which um, are not natural for sure, but which are accumulation of archaeological deposits during times. Because as you can see, the long occupation in Marga, for example, you have uh, 4,000 years of occupation uh, only for the Neolithic and Chalcolithic period. There is an accumulation of deposits. So in Marga, for example, um, to excavate the Neolithic site, I mean, people started at the surface of the site um, and dug until 9 or 10 meters. Um, so it's quite a deep uh, trenches conducted there. But in other sites, for example, it depends of, uh, I mean, the question, the issue, the objective of, of your program. In, for example, in other sites, if your program wants to, to, to know more about uh, the late levels, for sure you will only excavate a uh, few meters of uh, archaeological deposits. But if you want to reach the deepest level of the site, for sure you will have to, to, to dig for more than maybe 8 or 10 meters. And this is sometimes quite logistically uh, complicated to, to do because you cannot only uh, dig a big trench without, uh, you know, um, uh, doing some <laughs> management to, to access. Uh, and um, also we are also taking care, uh, I mean, for security reasons, most of the times after our excavations, we refilled these trenches. For example, the trenches we conducted at Chanudaro in 2015, it was a small sounding, but it was three meters deep. We wanted to reach quickly the oldest levels, but it was, I mean, it was impossible for us to let this open uh, because for we don't want, uh, for example, a, shy, a child coming to visit the site uh, uh, falling in. So, and to preserve also this mud brick architecture because when this mud brick architecture is exposed, for sure in the next months, uh, everything will totally disappear with the floods, moss and salt and everything. So you have to refill it. But it's not, I mean, it's never possible for all the excavated sites for example, Merga, um, I mean, dozens of hectares were excavated, so it was impossible to refill everything. Uh, any more questions? Let me uh, ask you the last question. Yes. And uh, once you excavate and complete your studies, how you hand over to this site to the national authorities is a mechanism available through which all these fascinating places are then hand it over to the national authorities for preservation? <coughs> yes, for sure. I mean, um, there is a law uh, which is uh, established. I mean, all the antiquities uh, which are um, collected during our excavations, they go to the Department of Archaeology here. And uh, there were all the archaeological me uh, material coming from uh, excavations in Baluchistan, for example, went to the exploration and excavation branch here in Karachi. And um, since the devolution, as you know, uh, now uh, the provinces uh, have the control of this archaeological material. So, for example, the ma archaeological material coming from uh, Balu um, Baluchistan um, is supposed to come back in Baluchistan now. And we only um, export sometimes, with, of course, some uh, official permissions of the government here, some very small fragments of archaeological material for analysis. Or, for example, some pieces like the weight in Shai Tump, you know, uh, it was a fantastic weight. And at this time of the excavations, it was not, not possible to analyze it in uh, Pakistan. So we exported it in France for a few months for analysis, and it came back in Karachi after. Dr. Bendir for your uh, very informative lecture. May I now request uh, Professor Dr. M. Iqbal Chaudhary to present the token of appreciation to our honorable speaker and conclude the lecture. Absolutely fascinating. You agree with me? 
I think the most fascinating was that she discovered 11 sites in two days. I wish you could stay about 20 days there. <laughs> but that actually represents the, the rich culture and heritage of this part of the world. And, uh, you know, when she was responding to questions, could see the patient, the motivation, the spirit she has. And that actually represents uh, this amazing eagerness to learn more about ancient cultures. Uh, we, unfortunately, do not really know much about our own culture and heritage. And we're so extremely grateful to the government of France and to you, Aurof uh, Dida, for a uh, wonderful work which your team is conducting, Alien Francie, the French Embassy, uh, for uh, conducting an absolutely wonderful and a systematic search for ancient cultures of this part of the world. Uh, this is a common human heritage because I'm sure uh, uh, 10,000 years before there was no uh, Pakistan or no Iran. Or this was all human being all over. So it's just all common human heritage. And thank you very much for introducing us to our own culture. Thank you very much. I would request Dr. Didier to come on the stage uh, for the token of appreciation. Thank you. So today you probably know better than me that this is also is uh, as ancient as Manjadar because uh, some of the figures, human figures, uh, wearing this design. So we would like to. Dear friend John Francis Shinan, uh, the director of Alien Francie. You know, uh, if you go and visit his center, it's absolutely fascinating. Uh, green uh, uh, walkways, wonderful garden, excellent uh, cinema theater, conference hall, languages, uh, French language courses, and more than that, you can have a real taste of France. Yeah. Please. <laughs> We have uh, another very distinguished guest, uh, Mr. Mark Bessett. Uh, he is the Consul for Communication and Public Relations, a person responsible of connecting us with France. to all of you. Uh, the objective of this uh, seminar series is to it actually introduce you to the other facets of life. Science uh, is one aspect of knowledge, but remember knowledge is holistic in nature. It's round up. When you understand, you wish to understand life, you need to understand other things also. For instance, I am a student of philosophy. Every day I, I keep reading about philosophy. And you need to understand a lot of it because if you want to understand humanity and human culture, you need to see the other aspect of it. So whether it's literature, archaeology, history, ancient uh, cultures, philosophy or languages is part of one single body of knowledge and that would make you a perfect scholar. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, sir. We would now invite all of you to proceed to the Mental Purpose Hall for refreshment. Thank you.
different kinds and so chemist and biochemist and molecular biologist and structural biologist and functional genomist and we just name it all of them put together are more interested in understanding the structures because the structures are related to their functions right so structure function relationship by the aspect ascope so the first scientist would like to know what are the contaminants present in food what are the basic ingredients of a food product uh, geologists would like to know what are the trace elements present geologists geologists would like to know what kind of organic matters present in different geological samples and all that so material scientists would like like to know what is that this big huge huge nano particles or super molecular super molecules would look like so everybody has a different prospects and understanding of nano spectroscopy no matter what you do in your life you would always be using an mass spectroscopy so you don't have an option you need to learn that okay and it's absolutely fascinating technique absolutely you go deeper into it and you start appreciating that feel more and more you understand that and you you feel that you like to know more about it also every day you develop appreciation of this field okay uh you yeah, um i am editing along with professor tarman a book series again published by algebra 12 books on various applications of nmr spectroscopy nmr for drug discovery and development nmr for food science and nutrition nmr for geological and forensic sciences nmr for medicine uh i am also by medical diagnosis there are 12 of such books which are coming and are internationally known book series actually so you imagine that uh, there are lots of literature which is coming forth uh, there are highly specialized journals magnetic resonance and journal of magnetic resonance uh, highly specialized journals which only publish anima but almost every journal which is related to chemistry biochemistry you go to nature science you just any journal which is related to molecules would have a reference of nmr spectroscopy so uh, nmr spectroscopy is everywhere inside you and outside you right okay uh, well i would like to take a holistic view of spectroscopy because uh, i don't really want to give you a bit meal uh, uh, fragmented information of uh, animar being one of many techniques but i think you need to have a holistic understanding a complete understanding of how these uh, techniques are actually used together and when the structure of any molecule big or small outside the tube inside the tube in brain outside the brain uh, in blood circulation or in uh, uh, in petri dish or, or anywhere structures are like a jigsaw puzzle and in order to understand structures you need to have variety of information you need to know their molecular weight you need to understand their molecular composition i'm sorry iske bagar mein kuch kar nahi sakta to if you want a cup of tea somebody will bring it for you also this is uh, by the way it has 50 compounds detected by nmr spectroscopy okay so uh you like to know uh, a molecule <coughs> what kind of chromophoric uv absorption vibrational frequencies a whole range of different thing so uh, several techniques are actually used to get this structure and all these techniques put together eventually gives you uh, a complete structure which you constantly self criticize and 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 then at one point of time the entire data agree with that structure okay so nmr uh, is one of many techniques so very important but one one of many techniques and in this course you will learn many of them you will learn uv ir mass spectrometry cdrd and a lot of them 
So I'll take a holistic view uh, of uh, uh, spectroscopy. There will be some nine, 10 lectures. I can't guarantee because when I start discussing NMR, I have absolutely no control on myself and, uh, and on the topic, honestly. Because I do not really know how long I need to, to explain a concept and how long it will take before we come on the same frequency. So maybe nine or could be 90. Right. Let's see how it evolves. And uh, it should focus on developing concepts. You see, uh, uh, very often we debate what should be the emphasis of uh, this course. Keep uh, discussing uh, what we need to do in that this course also. Whether it, it just need to be focused on application of anima, uh, whether we just learn how to interpret the NMR results. This is one approach. Uh, then equally valid approach is that uh, application you will learn anyway. I mean, if I give you an NMR spectrum and if I tell you these peaks need to be interpreted like that, soon you will learn anyway. But the concept in nuts and bolts the mechanistics in architect of LMR spectroscopy, you would not be able to learn. So eventually we decided that we will have a blend of both. We'll have a conceptual understanding of NMR, by understanding what uh, NMR is all about. The real theory of